Hello and welcome to this edition of the France 24 interview. My name is Jessica Le Mazurier and I'm joined today by American philanthropist Melinda Gates. Thanks for joining us here on France 24. You are the co-founder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and you're here uh, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. You're here with a warning. Your foundation is saying that the fight against global poverty is now under threat. Can you tell us why and what needs to be done? Sure. Well, the UN set a set of goals, these sustainable development goals in 2015, and the world has actually made incredible progress. We've halved poverty, we've halved uh, childhood mortality, that is deaths of children under the age of five. But what Bill and I want the world to know is that that progress is not inevitable. If we don't keep making the same investments in health and in education, we're not gonna have as prosperous of a world as we want. Now, European leaders are saying that reducing poverty in Africa uh, could also help to uh, stem the refugee crisis, mm -hmm. uh, to prevent conflicts, to prevent terrorism. Is that true? And uh, what are world leaders doing? Well, I think one of the things we have to say is that anybody who is a refugee they're not in a situation they want to be in. I mean, that's a terrible situation to have to pick up your whole family and move. And most of the people that I talk to in Africa would like to stay where they are if they know that they can prosper and their children can thrive and reach their full potential. And so I think the world has woken up to the fact that we need to make long-term investments, long-term investments in health systems around Africa so that babies grow up healthy and are fed properly and we need to make investments in education to make sure that kids get a quality education. Because if we do those two things, Bill and I call that human capital, we make those investments, then people are gonna lift themselves up out of poverty and they're gonna enhance their entire community and their economy and they'll lift themselves up on the continent of Africa. And so we've got to make those investments though. And which world leaders are leading the charge, so to speak? Well, I would say that presidents, uh, you know, the president of France, President Macron, is absolutely one of the people leading the charge. He and also Chancellor Merkel have been very strong on these issues. Um, but France has been very, very generous in the global community. You know, they're one of the founders of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And because of that fund that was originally set up, 22 million people are alive today that wouldn't otherwise be alive. So to see his leadership here and that he came out very strongly at the UN with his speech talking about multilateralism, talking about needing to end poverty and to make investments on behalf of women and girls, uh, those are not things that you heard world leaders say much in the past. And to say it in so boldly and loudly at the UN, that's incredibly important. What do you have to say to the president of your country, to Donald Trump? He is cutting foreign aid budgets. He is withdrawing uh, from international treaties uh, and is closing the borders of this country. And now, in his General Assembly address, he said that the US will no longer be giving its US dollars to countries that are not a friend of the United States. What's your response to that? Well, luckily in the United States, the, uh, the president proposes a budget but Congress disposes a budget. And so while this president has chosen to cut foreign aid in his budget, Congress has upheld that because you know what Congress understands? They understand that investments in foreign aid lift up people and lift them out of poverty. South Korea is a perfect example. They're a country that everyone used to give aid to. They've now moved up to middle and high income country status and now they give foreign aid to other countries. They've lifted themselves out of poverty. And so luckily our Congress understands that and has kept up the budget for foreign aid. But nevertheless, there have been cuts to foreign aid and there have been cuts in funding uh, to the United Nations mm -hmm. and its uh, aid projects. It seems as though uh, moving in to fill that vacuum are more uh, private contributors. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for the world uh, when billionaires have to uh, move in to fill this vacuum that's being left by Donald Trump and the United States? Well, it's a mistake for anyone to think that philanthropy can ever fill in government money. Philanthropy is a tiny, tiny piece of this sector. It's enormous amounts of government funding that allow infrastructure to be created, to allow health systems, tiny little health clinics to exist. 
So all philanthropy can do is shine a light and show some, take some risks and show models of work, what works, but it always takes government to scale up uh, various programs. So the perfect example is vaccines, the Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Nine million kids are alive because of that. Yes, for instance, Bill and I and other philanthropists have given very generously to that fund, but it's really hundreds of millions of dollars given by other governments that have bought those vaccines and delivered them to children all over the world. Now, you always put women front and centre. Uh, you believe that they're crucial to development. Uh, why is that? And can you explain why making contraception more available to women across the world is so crucial? Sure. Well, women and girls uh, are fundamental. If you want to lift yourselves out of poverty, you have to invest in women and girls. Women are often, the mom is often the center of the family. And one of the things we've come to learn is that when you invest in her, she invests in everyone around her. And so contraceptives are one of the tools that she needs. It's one of the best anti-poverty tools. It's not the only one, but it's one of the best because if she's educated about her body, so we educate her about her body and, and her reproductive health, then she can choose if and when to have children. And if she can space those births of those children, her children are more likely to survive, they're more likely to grow up healthy, and the family's likelier to be wealthy. We know that from great longitudinal data. It's one of the longest studies ever done in global health, is that contraceptives after, actually lift families out of poverty. Now, you have also been very vocal on the Me Too movement. Can you tell us what impact you think it's had here in the US and globally? I think the Me Too movement is holding people accountable for truly making change for women, for women finally being able to speak their truth about what has happened to them. I think there's both bias in society, and then I think there's also, on one end of the spectrum, and then there's also violence against women. And what you're seeing is by women coming out in droves and telling their story, they're giving power to other women to tell their stories and to say, this isn't okay. And then for society to react and say, okay, you can't have that man as the top of a corporation, or you can't have that male broadcaster who's done those things to women, or we can't have that person in the Senate who's done those things. And so it's holding all of society accountable. And the exciting thing to me was after the Me Too movement started is, I, you know, I have been traveling, I travel the world often, but to see it taking hold in country after country after country, and women so excited about it and emboldened by it to name their truth. Now, you have also personally encouraged more women to enter into the world of tech. Now, you took some time off uh, to take care of your children and then you returned uh, to the working world. What advice have you got for other women uh, listening to you now on how to uh, uh, get into the working world after having children and how to uh, cross these, these barriers that we face? I would say that you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And if you've left, as you said earlier, uh, the workforce to have a child and then decide to re-enter it, that's a great time to pick up your career again. But I do think there are structural barriers and you have to look at them in every country. And we need to lock arms as women and we need to get the enlightened men around us who also believe in women to help us knock down some of those barriers for women. And so I will say, for instance, in the United States, we don't have paid family medical leave. We're one of only eight countries that don't. I use my voice along with many partners to say that is not right and we're going to change that in the United States. Now you are one of the richest people in the world and you've given billions of your own money away. What problems would you say money just can't solve? Um, well money certainly can't buy you love, that's for sure. I think there's a good song about that. Um, and it doesn't solve everything. I mean, I think some people have this illusion that, oh, if I had money, I would be happy, or if I had money, I could, I don't know, do something else. It, you know, it doesn't create time for you. It doesn't create love, and it can actually get in the way sometimes of meaningful uh, conversations or connections. And so I would just say, you know, I live my life, despite the wealth that's come from Microsoft, I live my life just as I did, essentially, when I was a young girl, with those same values. Yes, I get to have nicer trips than I might have back then or do some other things, but, but as long as you keep your core values, I think then money doesn't really get in your way and doesn't influence you as much as, as it might. Now, you're known for being an optimist, but how can you really stay optimistic right now with the state of the world? 
When I look at the number of children who are alive today that were not alive, that wouldn't have been alive if they hadn't gotten a life-saving vaccine, you know, back in 2000, when I see the number of children that are alive, the number of people that have been lifted out of poverty. When I go to Africa, which I do many times a year, and I meet people who, you know, their life has changed. Even just traveling in West Africa, which I do a lot, you know, Senegal is, you know, Dakar today versus Dakar when I would go 10 years ago is a completely different place. And so, and I see people learning from the lessons in Senegal. I see contraceptives being more readily available to women. I see families lifting themselves out of poverty or starting small businesses. You just have to talk to people on the ground if you want to be optimistic and hear what their lives are really like. Your foundation has done an enormous amount of good around the world, but do you ever feel frustrated? Do you ever wonder if perhaps you might not want to enter politics one day to make even bigger changes, particularly in your own country? I like my job just the way it is, so I have no interest in uh, going into politics. But I have great respect for politicians who come into their roles really thinking about the entire world. You know, Bill and I have met with President Macron, and I think, and his wife Bridget, and I think one of the things that he thinks about is what what's right for his own citizens. I mean, that but also what's right for the world and how do we lift everyone up? And so for me, I look at our role in philanthropy as how do we partner with somebody like that? And um, how do we make sure that we give everybody lift around the world? And how do we do that in partnership with the people who do this incredible work out in the field and with governments and with leaders like President Macron? Melinda Gates, thank you very much for being with us here thank you. on France 24. Thanks for having me. You've been watching the France 24 interview. Do stay tuned.